Thanks everyone for holding. Thanks for coming along. This is Scott Green. I presented uh, last month's Back to Basics webinar. So this is Build Your AutoCAD IQ Back to Basics uh, Introduction to 2D Drafting Tools in AutoCAD 2016. Uh, with me, uh, who will be presenting today, is Zach Travis, and we also have Bryce Thalen on the line here to answer your questions. Let's go ahead. And so a little bit about us. All three of us work in Autodesk technical support uh, at the Lake Oswego office that's in Portland, Oregon. So up top you see Zach and then myself and uh, Bryce uh, didn't include a picture here. So we'll go here and uh, yeah, welcome back to Autodesk help webinar series. Uh, today is build your AutoCAD IQ. And we have a couple of upcoming classes here this month. So next month we'll have Beyond the Basics, Working with Line Types in AutoCAD 2016, followed by on the 18th, the Third Dimension, Point Clouds and Section Planes in AutoCAD 2016. And then on the 25th, we have Introduction to AutoCAD Architecture. That's going to be with Dave Potier. And then back with us, will be the uh, introduction to navigation tools in AutoCAD 2016. And again, uh, you can watch our past webinars on YouTube. And also we have a uh, build, your, build Your AutoCAD IQ webinar landing page that you can go ahead and visit. So uh, before we get started, just to remind you, feel free to leave any questions in the questions uh, chat window, and we'll answer those as time allows. Uh, this session will be recorded and, again, be uploaded to YouTube. Uh, links will be made available at the end of this uh, webinar. And there's also going to be a registration reminder for uh, the next webinars, uh, a post-webinar survey, and, again, uh, there's going to be a uh, question and answers period at the end of the webinar. We'll go for a few minutes then. And so we have a couple of featured articles I want to go over here today. Um, so we have, again, our top AKN downloads and articles are uh, the coordination model OSNAP support article, uh, the visual basic for applications module, uh, AutoCAD 2015 Service Pack 2, uh, educational software for students and teachers, free file viewers uh, for viewing, editing, and sharing uh, your DWGs, uh, AutoCAD 2016 Hotfix 1 and LT 2016 Hotfix 1, Hotfix 2, and some quick links to service packs, other downloads for AutoCAD and AutoCAD LT. And so today on this week's agenda, we will be going over uh, initial drawing setup uh, before you get started uh, with drafting. Uh, we'll go over the basic drafting tools in AutoCAD and AutoCAD LT, and then going over some of the uh, drawing commands and system variables. And here we have a couple of other additional resources before we begin. Um, that you may want to take a look at here. We have, of course, our Autodesk Knowledge Network community, the Hitchhiker's Guide to AutoCAD Basics that covers 2D drafting, Mastering AutoCAD 2016 and AutoCAD LT 2016 by George Ramura, and then the Ascent Educational Website for AutoCAD Training. So lastly, before we start, I want to ask a couple of polls if uh, you'd be so kind to answer these questions here. We have the first one here. I'll send this out. Is this your first Autodesk help webinar? Okay, so we have, it looks like for most so far, it looks like it's a no. So welcome back, everyone, uh, if you've already joined us before. A uh, few new people here, so again, welcome. And it looks like about 85% of you have voted here. I'm going to give it a, a couple more seconds before I end that, and then I'll go ahead into the last poll before we get started and uh, pass over to uh, Zach Travis here. So let's go ahead and uh, close that one out and do this last one here is, let's see. 
just want to see what kind of verticals of AutoCAD you're using or if you're using the, um, the main one here. go so we have AutoCAD AutoCAD LT architecture MVP uh, electrical mechanical civil 3d uh, map plant so let's see uh, what everyone is using these days it looks like the bulk of you either use uh, core AutoCAD or AutoCAD LT so uh, that's going to be really good for today uh, since it's going covering uh, just 2d drafting so that will be definitely helpful for uh, those of you uh, using LT. It's, uh, it's our main drafting uh, software that we have here for 2D. And so I'm going to go ahead and close out that poll now and get this switched over to Zach Travis, who will take you through the presentation. And good morning. Hopefully everybody can hear me out there. Hopefully everybody sees the screen okay. We're going to be going through some real basic stuff today. Uh, as in our last session, Back to Basics series, Scott took us through getting to know the AutoCAD interface, which was quite extensive because, honestly, there's a lot of buttons up there. <laughs> there's a lot of stuff to know, and it's really difficult to get through in, in the time allowed. But we did a great job there, and we'll move on a little further in this session. We're just going to be covering some of the tools necessary to get going with new drawings. Subsequent classes are going to cover things in much more detail, but for now, as this is the Back to Basics series, what we're going to go through today will be very limited in scope. So for anybody who came in here expecting a master class in all things drafting front to back, you may not be in the right place, sorry. I just don't want to lead anybody astray here and let them know that they're in a, a very basic course here. So first and foremost, let's get into AutoCAD. Uh, for today's demonstration, I'll be using AutoCAD 2016. And let's start up a brand new drawing. As you can see, there's a blank one. As Scott covered last time, even just the act of starting a new drawing has several options. We can start with a blank new drawing or with a predefined template file. Or there's even an older wizard you can access to get in, and it'll ask you questions like, what do you want your units to be, what do you want your angles to be shown in, things of that nature. But by default, the newer versions of AutoCAD have the startup variable set at 3, which when you first launch the program, it will take you into AutoCAD and it will just be the start screen, which is shown like this. Once you click to start a drawing, you, this will start used a blank drawing, or you can hit the pull down to choose from many of the templates that come with the program, or if you've got your own company standard templates, you want to start with any of those. But for our purposes today, we'll just use the basic ACAD DWT template, start up brand new drawing. Uh, if you want to look into the startup variable, other values of the startup variable are covered in the help and they tell you what they do uh, by setting startup to one. That's, for example, how you can get into the wizard where it will ask you various things about how you want your drawings to be set up. So now when you start a new drawing, before you draw anything, there are a lot of things to consider, but we're just going to cover some of the main ones here that, that people often take into account before getting started. So um, AutoCAD for better or worse, is what I call infinitely customizable, and that means that you can make a look and feel however best fits your workflow. And that can be both a blessing and a curse. Um, it's infinitely customizable, but that leads to an infinite number of issues that can arise from such customizations. The program has been around so long, it's such a mature product that many users have come and gone through the years and each having a, their own widely varying preferences to how they think the program should look and feel. Uh, some people just use it out of the box, just like this, like you see on the screen there, and others choose to customize heavily. Some people spend days and maybe a week at a time <laughs> getting things initially set up and then they take those customizations forward into the next release of AutoCAD that comes out so that no matter which version they're working in, everything looks and feels just exactly precisely the way they want it. So um, yeah, again, here in support, we get a lot of calls from people who it seems like you know their entire existence and workflow in AutoCAD hinges upon whether or not their customizations work correctly. And we made it so that they can do that. So they're absolutely right. The customization should work. 
properly and should look exactly the way they want them to. So uh, moving on, uh, AutoCAD, as you all know, originally, it's, I mean, it's a very mature product, as I said, and it's another word for old. Uh, it's originally based in DOS, and we graduated to Windows many, many, many years ago. Along the way, we've had lots of different configuration options. We've had screen menus and toolbars and a dashboard, and finally, we're now up to what you see in front of you up at the top there. We call the ribbon. It has many toolbars and pull-down menus and whatnot available there, but um, overall, throughout the years, there has always been debate, there always will be debate on what looks best, what works best. And the bottom line is whatever works best for you, that's what you should go with and what you should stick with. So we're only going to touch on a couple of the user interface elements here before we get into actually drawing objects in AutoCAD, but I just wanted to show you a couple more of the widely used and popular customizations that we see people using when we talk to them here in support. So we'll start by going into options. And there are a couple ways to even do that. Um, usually I just type OP, press enter, and go into options that way. You can also right click it. There's some menu option ways to get into it. So I'll bring that over for us to see there. So what I wanted to cover first is the display tab. So there's a couple of color schemes that we ship with makes it so that the buttons in the ribbon are darker or lighter. But where a lot of people like to go first off is into the colors area down here. And within colors, you can change virtually everything about the way AutoCAD looks and feels from the background color, which you can see is kind of a dark slate gray. You could just make your uniform background straight up black, which a lot of people like because that's the way the older programs made it. Uh, you can change the colors of your crosshairs, you can change the colors of the sheet and layout, and you see back there behind all this there's a grid over the entire drawing area. You can change the colors of the grid lines to really exaggerated colors. We'll do that just to see what that looks like here and make it as obnoxious as we can. So if we apply that, you can see back there, there's our grid much more pronounced and defined than the way that it ships. And you may want it that way and you may not want it that way. <laughs> I wouldn't want it that way, but it's an available option. Uh, if you ever want to restore everything back to the way it came out of the box, there's a button here. And yeah, we'll restore all that. So in addition to the colors, you can uh, change some other settings. If we go over to user preferences, there is a button here that talks about the right-click customization. And why would anybody want to right-click customization option in AutoCAD? Um, the Enter key, you see up here, it gives you an option for the Enter key. A lot of commands, well, every command either starts or ends. You can start it by using the Enter key or the space bar. You can get out of commands with the Escape key. A lot of people like to assign Enter to their right click. So as they're working along, they can draft more quickly, press Enter, gets you out of a command, pressing Enter again, starts up the command again. So that's a reason why you want to customize your right click. Now, if you go with this bottom option down here and just set it for Enter, what you lose by doing that is the ability to get right click menus uh, during the commands uh, based on your settings down here. So the setting that I, I prefer is the one at the top here, which is the time sensitive right click. And it gives you the best of both worlds, whereas if you click quickly with your secondary mouse button, the right mouse button in most cases, you'll get it used as an enter command. But if you hold it for longer than the time spent here, and the default is 250 milliseconds, if you hold it longer than that during command, you'll get the shortcut menu, the context menu, based on that command. So that'll give you more options within the context of that command. So um, this is probably the one that I, I would recommend to most people uh, if you're looking to use the right click or the secondary click button as the enter, but also to not lose the functionality that you get with the various context menus inside the commands. So let's apply that change and close out of here. And another thing I wanted to get into before we get into actually drafting things is the dynamic input. And the dynamic input is when you start typing, you see the little pop-up thing there 
appears right by the crosshair, that's your dynamic input. And it will not only display the commands that you're working in, that you're typing in, it'll also show the various prompts that are subsequently resulting from those commands that you've started. And it'll show you things like the angle of the line that you're drawing and other things. So whether you want the dynamic input on or off is another setting you might want to explore. Uh, the dynamic input toggles on and off and we'll turn the button on down along the bottom for dynamic input and it is this guy right here. Dyn mode variable is what's controlled by this button so we can either toggle it off or toggle it on. Uh, additionally you can turn it on and off with the F12 function key on your keyboard. So as you can see already there are various ways to do pretty much everything on AutoCAD. There's no one way to do almost anything. So it, it gives you the flexibility to really design your workflow for, for whatever works best for you. So um, the commands that you type in, again, they'll either appear at the dynamic input prompt or they can also appear down at the command line. For many, many years, there only was the command line. That's how you had to get commands started in AutoCAD. Uh, there was no other option. There were no buttons. There were no toolbars way back. So uh, the command line is still there for those who have been with the product for a long time and just prefer typing things in that way. Maybe it's a quicker way for them to draft. Uh, by default, the command line now comes anchored along the bottom, just one line. Uh, a lot of people like to grab it by the grip over here and drag it down to the bottom where it gets a little bit larger and you can actually adjust the height of it here so that you can see not just the one line that you're typing but also a couple more lines of the command history and if you ever want to view your command history in, in full you can always press F2 which brings up the AutoCAD text window and you can scroll up or down within that depending on how long the command history is and what you've got it set for. And then the last thing I wanted to cover is considerations for your drawings themselves. Um, depending on where you live, you might use the imperial system of feet and inches. Depending on where you live, you might use the metric system. So the basis for your drawings will vary according to that. And there are a few different system variables that are controlled that control what kind of drawing units you use. For example, there is the measure init variable. And I'll show you that now. I'll just type it in here. Measure init, what it does is it dis controls whether or not new drawings that you make will be set up for imperial or metric. And they subsequently control the value, the subsequent value of the measurement variable that's drawing specific. So your measure init is a global variable across the whole system. The measurement variable is drawing specific so you can change it as you go. The other main area where you'll find that people go to set up their drawings is under the application menu over here under drawing utilities and we'll go into units. By default, most of the basic templates have decimal set up as the length type, but the other common one that we see people use is architecture, so that they can input coordinates in feet and inches as they go. Um, the insertion scale controls how things are scaled when you insert them into your drawing. Um, for imperial, is typically inches. And for metric drawings, we'll usually see this be set to millimeters, but anything within there you can choose. It just depends on what you need for your drawing. Also, they got the settings for the angles. Uh, decimal degrees is usually what we see people use, but there are other options in here. And for all these things that I'm not covering really in depth, there's always a help button. There's always the great help system within AutoCAD. You can further explore the various dialogues and, and uh, variables as you wish. Now, in a lot of cases, you're going to work for a firm that has drawing standards and templates already set up. So in a lot of instances, you won't even need to worry about all this drawing setup stuff. It's already done for you. But if you're a sole proprietor, uh, just doing some side work, drafting, you're doing your own stuff from scratch, you're making your own templates, you'll want to know 
what your clients are going to want their drawings to come out in. We've had many, many a case here in support where people come and say, I've got a drawing and I need it converted over to this or that. And they say, well, I only started off with this way because I didn't know any better. And now I've got some more work to do after I've finished my drawing and converting everything where if they'd done it ahead of time, they could have saved themselves a bit of work down the line in uh, setting up their drawings before they actually started drafting. So that's it about setup. So let's actually get into drawing some objects and making some things here in AutoCAD. What I'm going to mainly cover here today is the draw panel or the upper portion of the draw panel on the home ribbon tab. Now you can see there are some other commands down here in the pull down from the draw ribbon panel, but I'm not going to cover those today. What we're just going to cover is the stuff up on top here. So we're going to start logically our left, and we're going to go with the line command, the humble line command. It's uh, been the basis of many millions of drawings throughout the years since AutoCAD's inception. Now with a lot of the commands, or most of the commands for that matter, you'll have a tooltip by default turned on if you hover over the command that tells you not only the command down below that you would actually type in if you were typing the command, but it also gives you a little description of what the command does and what you can use it for. And as always, there's the F1 option there to bring up the help, which will give you more in-depth information about whatever specific command it is you're running. So let's start with the line command. Just click on it. First thing it's going to ask us for is to specify our first point, our first vertex, wherever we want to put it. So we'll just put it here, and it's going to then ask us for the next point. And as we go, it'll ask us for the next point, and the next point, and the next point, until we either press Escape or press Enter to get out of it. Now, since I've got my right click set as enter, I'm just going to quickly right click and end the command. Enter also will start up your next command, so if I want to restart the line command, having just ended it, I can just quickly right click again, and again I'm back into the line command and it's asking me to specify the first point. Now, without getting out of the command this time, I'm going to hold the right click a little bit longer until I get the context menu, and we'll take a look at what options we have on that. So, first thing notice is the close feature for the line command. If we do that, what will happen is it will end our command after placing the next and last vertex in our line series, and it's going to put that at the exact point where we started this line command. So, if I close this, it should put close it up over here. So let's do that. And that's exactly what it did. So let's start up the line command again. And this time we'll take a look at the other option in there right after close, which is undo. And maybe sometimes maybe you put the vertex in the wrong spot. Maybe you want to undo it. The undo in the context of the line command will undo the last vertex that you placed. So it goes back to up here. If we do it again, it's going to go back down to this one, and so forth until we get back to the beginning. And speaking of putting things in the wrong place, I probably should cover the erase command. It's probably one of the most important things that you'll know about AutoCAD. And again, all this is very simple, but man, without the erase command, where would we be? So there are several ways you can get rid of objects if you don't want them. You can select them first, press the delete key on your keyboard, and they're gone. If I undo that, I can also select them, and I can right click. And on my context menu, I'll have an option to erase them. Or the other way is that you can issue the command first, in this case, erase, and it'll then prompt you to select the objects that you want to get rid of. Now the command preview there just kind of shows you what it's going to look like when you get rid of these individual things. So you can click them and click them and do several options within and then enter when you're finished to complete the command. Now one nifty thing that uh, our friend Voker taught me when preparing for this webinar was uh, that with several commands, the start point, so I'm going to end this line here. Now if I start the line command back up again, it's going to prompt me for the next point that I want to start my next line 
series from. Now I can use object snaps to, and that's what that green box is there, it's a, I'm going to snap the start of my next line to the end of the last line. Now I don't have to necessarily use object snaps if I want to start at the same place that I left off. The last one, a little shortcut here, is you can put in the at symbol and press enter and it will automatically place your first vertex at the last vertex that you placed in your drawing. So let's just get rid of all these lines and move along. So the next thing we come to is the polyline. Now in a lot of respects, the polyline is like the line command in that you can draw a bunch of segments with it. However, with line, each individual segment of your line, your continuous line path, are separate objects. There's a line, and if I pick, I can pick just one individual line from that and get rid of just those. However, with a polyline, I'll draw pretty much the same thing. And now when I pick one part of it, it picks the whole thing because the all lines are considered part of that single polyline object. Now I can explode the polyline and it will then revert down into individual line segments. But for right now, I don't want to do that. So we'll just undo that and turn it back into a polyline. Now, in addition to straight line segments, the polyline command, as you can see from the button up here, and if you hover, it'll give you a description, you can also create straight line segments and arcs as well. So let's show how that works. So when you start a polyline, you've got several options down at the command line, or if you press the down arrow, you'll see them by the dynamic input pointer. So let's say we want to make our next segment be an arc. So we can just choose that here and specify the end point of the arc. And now if we want to switch back to lines, you can see down below with the command line, any of the highlighted letters down there in blue are the ones that you can just press in to switch to those various things. Like if I type L, for example, we'll switch back to making a line segment here with our polyline. Now you see a few other options down here, such as width. Now with the polylines, you can change your width on the fly as you're drawing the objects. So let's say I want to make the uh, starting width of my next segment of the P-line, let's make it 1. That's pretty thick. So let's end that. Now one thing that I notice that's interesting is when you explode a polyline that has width, so let's just do that real quick. We'll use X for explode. You can also obtain this on the modify ribbon tab at the top. All the resultant lines and arcs and various pieces of the former polyline now don't have any thickness any longer. Now a very powerful tool that you use in conjunction with polylines is the p-edit or polyline edit command. So we'll just key that in here. So now if I want to select this line, we know it's not a polyline because I just exploded it. Now it's just a line. It'll ask me if I want to turn it back into a polyline. And yes, I do. Then I get the options for what I can do from here. A lot of times when we wanted to do a join, so I can select other line segments and arc segments that I want to join to become one polyline again. And maybe I want to apply a width to the whole thing. So that's another option within the join. And let's just say, let's make it one. There we go. And enter ends the command.
So there are a lot of other options you can do and, and you can see down here within each of the polyline commands, the various prompts are very deep. Again, this is one of those things where just for time I'm going to say the help is probably your best uh, explainer of all of this, uh, as well as the Hitchhiker's Guide. It has a lot of good stuff in there on the polyline command. So we don't want to dwell too much on any one thing here. So let's clear off our polylines. Let's move on to circle. Pretty basic, the default option for circle. If you hit the pull down here, you'll see there are several options for making a circle, but the default option is just to specify the center and then the radius. The next one is to specify the center and the diameter. They're very similar. We'll give them both a whirl and see how they work here. So for the circle, we're just going to come in here and place the center point, and we can either click to specify how long the radius is, or we can just type it in. So let's say 5, enter and it makes our circle with a radius of 5. Similarly, we can do the circle option with diameter. Same thing, you specify the center, then you put in maybe 20 for your diameter, and you've got a circle that meets those criteria. The next ones down are a little different. Two point does exactly what it says there in the tooltip. Creates a circle using two endpoints of the diameter. You can put the diameter at any specified angle that you want, or if you happen to have the orthogonal setting turned on and your angles are locked at, say, 90 degrees, then you could only place the diameter, diameter at 90 degree angles and place your circle that way. The next option is a three-point, which expands on the two-point thing, but it just gives you a little more flexibility after you specify where the diameter is that you can just then go ahead and put in that third point sort of looks like the Death Star. There, we'll take that one off. Okay, there we go. So the last two talk about your tangents and your radius and harkens back to geometry or trigonometry class, so hopefully you remember some of that. Uh, the the tooltips here I think are excellent and it gives a really good graphical representation of exactly what is going to happen when you run this command. So, for example, let's make a circle where we do tangent, tangent, radius. So we'll choose tangent to this circle and tangent to this circle and then it automatically puts in our radius down there for us. We just have to press enter to accept it. Now, it doesn't like this because we tried to make it inside this bigger circle. What it would prefer that we do is to, let's say, take two circles that are where you've got a, a good tangent side over here and over here. So we'll choose this here and this here. And it makes the circle for us with a predefined radius. And lastly, we'll, and uh, one thing I want to point out too is that it doesn't necessarily have to be just circles. You can also do lines, for example. If you wanted to do this last circle option, tangent, 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 we'll say pick the line for the first thing, and then pick this circle and pick this circle. Now, it wouldn't be uncommon for the circle that we end up drawing to not actually touch a couple of the objects, like here. It's not actually touching this line, but if you extend this line out, you can bet that it's going to be tangent to that line up here. So it does whatever it can within the parameters of what you give it. Those are your circle options. One last thing I want to cover with circles, though, I before I forget. Uh, just as with the line, you can type in the at symbol to start at the same last point you specified. You can do that with circles, too, which is really nifty for making concentric circles. So if we start another circle command here, and it asks for the center point, now we can use our object snap to pick the center point, but we can also just as easily put in the at symbol, press enter, and it automatically puts our center at the center of the last circle. Just a couple of little maybe underknown and overlooked things, but some people use them, some people don't. It just depends on when you were taught.
So next, after circles, we come to arcs, and there are a lot of options for arcs. So in the interest of time, I'm just going to cover a couple of them here. Um, now, initially, start center end and start center, uh, sorry, end three point um, would appear to kind of do the same thing, and you can do the same thing with both of them. So for example, we'll go three point. It's going to ask us for the start point and the second point and the end point. Now we'll go do the same thing with start, center, end. Start, center, end. And it pretty much gives us a similar arc. But if we go back to the three point, it doesn't necessarily have to go in that order. So for example, you can place, place the start point or if you notice down the command line or at the prompt with the down arrow, it gives you the option to specify the center of your arc first. So let's do that. Now I'm going to specify my start point and then my end point. So just a little slight variation there that gives you more flexibility when you create your arc. And that's what all these other ones are set up to do here as well. So I invite you to check out the help, check out the Hitchhiker's Guide. Uh, even the tool tips will tell you and show you what all of these things do. So in the interest of time, we'll skip over a few of them today. So let's clear out our arcs here and go into another fan favorite of rectangle. And in case you're wondering, yes, I know this is fairly dry, but what are you going to do? It's a rectangle. There we are. That's how we mostly know and love our rectangles, just like that. But within the confines of the simple rectangle command, we've got many options that a lot of people don't ever even ever explore. So if you see down here, after you specify your first point, you can chamfer your corners. You can change your elevation. You can fill it the corners. You can change the thickness or the width. So let's do a couple of those things just to see how they work. And maybe the next time you do a rectangle, you'll consider some of these other things that maybe didn't occur before. So let's start off a rectangle here. So after we specify our first point, let's say we want to put in a fillet. Or not. Let's start that over again. So let's put in a radius of 2. And now we'll go back and specify our first corner. And we can see that our corners are no longer right angles, but they are filleted. And these little circles here have a radius of 2 units. And the next time I make a rectangle, it's going to do that same thing. So a lot of these commands you'll find in AutoCAD, whatever the settings you used for the last command, they're the settings that are going to hold forward into the next command that you execute until you reset them to the defaults. So if, for example, we could uh, change our fillet back to zero and then go back to making just a regular right-angled corner rectangle. So let's check out the rotation option here. So let's do R for rotation and let's give it a 45 degree angle. So from this point we're going to be making a 45 degree angle that starts at where we clicked our first point and we'll end where we click our second corner. And just like with the fillet, the rotation option holds through to the next rectangles you make until you reset it to be a rotation of zero. That gets you back to how things started. Let's clear these all out here. And go over just a couple more things before we move on from rectangle. So we can do the creation of rectangles by area. So let's say we know the area of the rectangle. We put in an A. And let's say we'll make it 175. It's going to ask us first for the length. We put in, say, 25. So it's going to fill in whatever the other dimension is for us. In this case, we can look in the properties palette and see what that ended up being.
So the length is 64 on this, and the height was, I believe we put 25. So that's just a way to make AutoCAD do a little bit of the thinking for you. But in most cases, you're going to know which points you want to specify for your rectangles. Again, some of these options within the commands are lesser used, but if you need them, they're there, and they're uh, handy things to use. And lastly, we'll do the dimension option here, where it's going to ask us for length and width. So we'll just go you know, 15 for the length and uh, 85 for the width. How about that? And it is then still asking us for the other corner, though, because based on our start point, we could put it over here or down here or down here. So all we have to do is click whichever quadrant around that starting point we want to place the rectangle at. And there we are. So let's get out of here. Let's quickly cover the pull down here on the rectangle. And just as rectangle is a special polyline that makes a rectangular polyline, we're just going to quickly make a polygonal polyline. The default is to have four sides, but let's just put in seven, just to make it a little more interesting. Specify the center, just like we would the center of a circle. And we can make it our polygon inscribed in a circle or circumscribed about a circle. So let's just do the inside one. And then specify the radius, and you can choose the angle as you go. And just like with the circle that starts with a center point, the polygon starts with a center point as well. So let's do another one with five sides. And for our start point, do the at symbol, which will start us at the same point as we did the last one. As with all these commands, there's a lot more to explore. So please do so. There's a lot of nifty things in there that you'll find that you probably use and put in your own personal toolkit. Last thing we're going to cover here are ellipses, which are kind of like a stretched out circle, kind of like an oval. There's not much really to them as far as making them. You'll specify in this first option the center of the ellipse, the end point, and then you'll change your radius accordingly, however you want it. A couple of other options in here are the axis end. Let's take a look at that one. There's not a whole lot of variation within the ellipse because, well, there aren't very many differences between ellipses when it comes right down to it. So, uh, and let's get to the last one here. And let's make an elliptical arc. And depending on the options you choose in here, there we go, and then we can make this down to just an arc. So this last option is pretty nice because it allows you to create an arc it looks like an ellipse, but it's as if you cut a section out of it without having to first draw the ellipse and then cut the section out of it in two separate commands. It combines them all into one command for you, which makes it real convenient if you happen to be needing that kind of an object. So as with all these things, you might not need exactly every option within the command. You may not ever even need to make a polygon that has seven sides. But just knowing that you can is part of the knowledge that goes along with using AutoCAD and this is the reason why there are college courses out there. There are really heavy, thick books out there for the program. And uh, the, the feature set is always expanding. So I invite you to get as much information about the product as you can, get as much training as you possibly can, um, be it by books or these webinars or any other YouTube videos you might come across. There's a lot of good information out there. Fortunately, it's a mature product. And being a mature product that it is, it has a lot of years of history behind it, and a lot of people know about it and want to share that knowledge with the world. So um, unlike some more obscure softwares, AutoCAD, really, if you want to teach yourself, 
it's it's not a bad idea. Uh, there's a lot of information out there for you, but uh, I think everybody probably benefits from from some structured learning somewhere along the line, especially if you're going to be using this tool in a, in a professional sense. So that's pretty much all I was going to cover. Now, you may be saying, well, what about this other command here on the draw uh, panel of the home ribbon tab here, hatch. Hatch is another thing unto itself. Hatch could probably fill up at least a webinar by itself. So we're going to skip hatch for today. Uh, we're going to skip the other commands down on the draw command. At this point, I'd like to open up for questions a little bit here and see how everybody's feeling about what we've gone through today and anything you might like to see before we finish out the hour today. Scott, how are we doing on questions there? Uh, it looks like most of the questions are being answered by Bryce and myself. We do have uh, one that just came in. How do you change the color of the ribbon background? Uh, to my knowledge, there's two choices. You have the dark color scheme and the light color scheme. That would be under your options dialog uh, um, off of the application menu in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, you would go under the options dialog to the display tab. Uh, where under window elements uh, there is the color scheme um, options and um, by default it looks like it's set to light and then you can change it to light or dark um, so unfortunately you can't change the colors themselves uh, to blue or green but uh, there's there's two different schemes so you have a light gray and a dark gray you can have any color you like as long as it's black no, just <laughs> I think that was somebody else that said that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's see what else we have coming in here. Oh, hi, Renee. Thanks again, yeah. Um, while I was on the Revit team, uh, I remember working uh, some of your cases before I remember you. And uh, let's see here, what else do we have here? Oh, yes, the slide that references uh, the books. Uh, that would be George Mura. Yes. Um, one second, actually. You can... And while Scott gets that up on the screen there, I'll throw in that the series of books that George Omura has put out is the Mastering series. Um, he writes the Mastering AutoCAD, but there are also other Mastering books for other softwares out there. So they're all excellent. The ones for AutoCAD are particularly good. They cover both AutoCAD and AutoCAD LT. They'll tell you when a command is only going to work in LT versus full AutoCAD, which has a much bigger feature set. And uh, there are a lot of pages. I mean, usually the, uh, the mastering AutoCAD books are on the order of about a thousand pages each. So here we go, Mastering AutoCAD 2016 and AutoCAD LT 2016 by George Murrah. Um, the asset link is for uh, web training, uh, but let's take a look here. I believe uh, from what I found, I found this up on uh, Amazon here, and this is uh, should have a picture of the cover here. If you can see that here, so it's a uh, it's a blue book, Mastering AutoCAD 2016 by George Murrah. It's by uh, Cybex, and uh, looks like you have a couple options here to buy used and new. Um, but uh, we have uh, a number of books uh, by George Murrah here that has covered uh, several different. Uh, software and uh, software versions over the years and so uh, it's it comes highly recommended uh, I have a couple of copies myself uh, let's go back to the presentation here seems like people might want to see the startup wizard so we can show that so if we cancel and we change our startup variable to one so we'll then close out of the existing drawing we're working in. Can't remember if this requires a restart. I guess not. Here we are. One second. We can't see your screen, uh, Zach. Let me just give this back over to you. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. So what I've done is I've changed the startup variable from three to one. And to do that, I just typed in startup at the command line, changed it to one. Next time I went up to the top and said file new up here in the corner, it brings up this create new drawing wizard. And you can do a few things here. You can open a drawing uh, from a folder with this first button. 
you can start from scratch. Uh, we still can't see your screen, Zach. Uh, you should have been prompted to accept the changeover. There we are. And I'm going to go ahead and post the link um, again to that book. So go ahead here. This will be in chat. There we are. Sorry about that, gang. So here's your new drawing wizard. You can choose whether you want your drawing to be imperial or metric. Uh, if you hit OK, it'll take you to some other options. Uh, you can also start from a template. It gives you all the templates you had to pick from before. Um, here's the wizard that we were talking about. So you can do a quick setup, which is fewer steps, but let's go through the advanced one just to see what's in here. So what kind of drawing units do we want to use? Decimal, engineering, architectural, feet and inches, fractional, or scientific. And you can set your level of precision depending on which option you choose above. So for example, architectural goes out to however many fractions of a, an inch versus decimal, which takes you straight out to however many points after the places after the decimal point you want to go. Change your angle settings. All these can be modified within the drawing units dialog that we looked at earlier, but if you like it in a wizard format, this is fine too. The wizard is a little bit a legacy. It's from the far prior versions of AutoCAD, but it's been kept in the program just because people like it and they're used to it and familiar with it, so we'll keep it in there. So now that we're done through the wizard, now we're in our drawing setup. And you notice that on this drawing, it doesn't have the grid on by default. Most of the newer templates are going to have the grid display turned on by default, and that is a drawing-specific variable. So you could have one drawing that doesn't have the grid, one drawing that does show the grid. That's drawing-specific. So to sum up and wrap up the question, there really isn't a command for the startup wizard per se, but if you change the startup variable to a value of 1 and you start a new drawing at that point, then you'll have the option to choose the wizard to go into. Hope that helps. Let's see here. Craig has a question. When I drag a window to uh, select lines to delete, I have a lasso instead of a rectangle window. How do I change that, Zach? Aha. Okay. So let's go into Options. We'll just type OP, or we could also right-click, go to Options. So that is all handled on the Selection tab within Options. Lassoing is relatively new for AutoCAD. It's only been in there a couple of releases. Um, if you press and drag, you'll get a lasso. Whereas if you press, if you just the two corner points of a window, and I'll show you what I'm talking about here just so it's not so abstract. So let's draw some lines in a circle. And if I drag a window around them, it's going to make this lasso. Versus if I click like imagine there's going to be a rectangle over the that encompasses these two objects. I'm going to click the starting corner up here, and I'm going to click the other corner down here. That doesn't execute the lasso. So what brings in the lasso is when I click my first point and then I drag. Now, if you don't like that option at all, you can turn it off. If we go back to the selection tab within the options dialog, we can just uncheck this box. And if we hover over it, you'll see that these check marks in this section right here, the implied windowing, they all affect the pick auto system variable. If you ever look that up in help, it'll give you the various values. It's a, it's a uh, bitmapped uh, variable in, in that it's got uh, numbers that add up to the, the current value and what that includes. So if we just uncheck this option here and we hit OK, Let's go back now and we'll drag a window here. And this time dragging a window gives me exactly what I think it is that you're after. 
So good question. Yeah, that's something that came up a lot. People, when, when we first introduced that, a lot of folks said, what is this thing and how do I get rid of it? I don't like it. It's not what I'm used to. So um, usually when there's a new feature comes in, that will uh, be the case that there is a way to disable it. It may not be obvious at first, but uh, if you post us a message or give us a call through support, whichever way you want to get a hold of us, or even in the forums, a lot of times you'll find if it's a new feature, it's often covered in the forums because people uh, get in the forums and, and hash out the new features from the new products. Do they like them? Do they not like them? How do I turn them off? Et cetera, et cetera. So hopefully that gives you what you're after there, just unchecking that one box. Okay, we got a couple of other questions coming. So uh, to my knowledge, um, it looks like Taylor asks, will the wipeout command ever get a rectangular mode? To my knowledge, correct me if I'm wrong, Zach, but that's by uh, Polygon only. I believe that it is, yeah. yeah. Okay. And it looks like we have a couple other questions here from, we got Travis, Mark, Teresa, Adam, Mike. Um, so back up to Travis, I have, uh, I've never seen the press and drag an object. Do you have to hold the line work or anywhere on screen once selected? No, just any, any old place. So are you talking, you know, I assume we're talking about the lasso thing here. Um, let's see here. Or I guess you can, you can press and drag. Um, oh, oh, I, it could be this option he's talking about here. It's kind of hard to know from the description, I guess, what it specifically is that they're after there. Um, any options that, that affect press and drag are going to be right here, though, in this section of the selection tab in options. Hmm. Okay, so we got another question here uh, for a, uh, a rectangle. For drawing a rectangle at an angle, can you select a line in your drawing to determine the angle of the rectangle? I don't believe so. Let me try it here. I know what you're saying. So, like, if you wanted to match the angle of a line. So this line, for example, has an angle of 231, it shows. So can we reference that angle to make a rectangle? I'm going to say no, but I don't want to say no prematurely. Let's take a look. Rectangle, we'll specify our first point. We'll do a rotation. Well, there is the pick point option. Let's do that. So let's go this point and this point. Oh, there we have it. Looks like we can. Okay, and just a heads up for everyone. It looks like we have a couple minutes left, so we're going to try to get through as many questions as we can here as time allows. Um, so next here we have... How can I go back to the classic DIM mode? Uh, to my knowledge, uh, in 2016, you can no longer revert back to the classic um, user interface. And so for the classic tools, the classic user interface, that would have to be brought in uh, through a CUI file. Isn't that right, Zach? Correct. If you have a, a version of the CUIX file from 2014, for example, which still has the classic user interface, and I'm assuming they're, they're talking about the classic workspace here, uh, yeah, you can drag that in with the customized user interface. And uh, there is an article on that. If uh, Bryce, do you want to maybe put that article into the questions uh, section there so everybody can see it? That'd be great. If you put a link to that. Uh, there are some instructions in that article that talk about how to get it from a previously existing CUIX file, or you can also build your own workspace that's classic because the toolbars and the menus are still there in the program. They're just not you know, all grouped together as one workspace called classic, and that's all it ever really was, was just a, a convenient grouping of all those elements of the user interface together, and we called it classic, so it looked like the uh, pre-2009 versions of AutoCAD. And we got another, uh, we got a few other quick questions we can touch on here. So next one is, can you pre-select the printer you wish to use? instead of selecting from drop-down menu. Uh, as far as I understand, that's page setup. Is that not uh, saving out your page settings uh, for a printer and what CTB you're using and uh, page sizes and whatnot? Right. Page setup can be pre-configured and it can be embedded into your templates from which you then would start every new drawing. And as long as you do that, then your page setups will be there and available 
Uh, the, the thing is, the page setups are on a per layout basis, though. So, for example, the model tab has one page set up, and all the other layout tabs have their own uh, individually configured page setups. But uh, if you've got a page setup specified in your template, you can choose that page setup then for any subsequent layout you might create within that drawing. And page setups are also transferable from drawing to drawing in several ways. So, so absolutely, yes, you can set up your page setups to use a specific printer, specific paper size, specific plot style tables. All that stuff can be pre-configured, yes. So you don't have to do it every time. And just a few more left here. Uh, let's see if we can't finish up. We got, why does uh, 2016 DWG to PDF PC3 uh, randomly black out uh, my blocks? I have a wipeout background on. Um, that sounds like a good troubleshooting question. You may want to post that on a forum or send us in a support case if you have uh, um, support uh, with us. But uh, for my recollection, that sounds like a CTB or possibly a layer uh, issue. You might want to uh, check with support on that. Uh, we have a couple of other questions here. Uh, let's see. Adam says, uh, click and drag on the line works is how object dragging works. Okay, let's move on. We got, if I sit the drawing unit in my drawing at 1 8th and import something from another drawing that's set on 1 16th, will it change my current drawing from, uh, that's Kara Lukens. Uh, I believe drawing uh, scales, that's by drawing only, is it not? Right. When you bring a drawing element in from another drawing, uh, it will take your current insertion scale into effect and it will scale the foreign object, if you will, that you're bringing in. It will scale it uh, in a way that it, it, it matches up with the insertion scale set in your current drawing. It doesn't change a setting in your current drawing. Okay, we got a couple of other, few more questions here, trying to finish up here. Uh, how do I make a layer without it being frozen in other viewports, um, prevent from automatically freezing in layouts? Well, there are a couple of different ways to set up your layers, and let's just take a quick look at the layers properties, and layers is for another webinar altogether, because layers is very, very deep, but while we have it here, let's cover this real quick. All righty. So let's go to a layout and let's activate our viewport here. So I think what you're referring to here are these options here. So if I've got a new layer, this is called layer one. If I say new VP freeze on this layer, what should happen then is any subsequent viewport I make on any other layout, in those new viewports that I make, the viewport should be frozen. So let's test that out. Let's just click that option there. And let's go to layout two. I'm just going to make a new viewport here. So let's Okay, while you do that, I'm going to try to get out the last uh, poll question here before we uh, start uh, losing everyone here. So we do have one last item here. Uh, did you learn anything new today in today's session? So while Zach covers that question, uh, let's go ahead and take a look at the poll. So hopefully you did learn something new, even if it's a little obscure <laughs> legacy option within various commands. Maybe you can incorporate it in your workflows, maybe it'll help you out. And that's really the goal with these webinars, is to just give you some extra tools that maybe you didn't know, uh, maybe you already did, but uh, there are some other nuances to the commands that you never explored. So hopefully this, this um, inspires you to go explore the commands a little further and see if maybe there's ways to use them that can improve your workflows that you've already been using. Okay, let's go ahead. It looks like uh, we're stuck here about 67%. So it looks like 92% of you said yes. So that's always good. Helps us. And uh, so back to Adam real quick here to clarify, uh, not the DIM tool in the classic mode itself, but the classic or the older behavior of the DIM command. 
that mm. I'm not quite sure of because it's changed so much since uh, you know 2013, 2012. Yeah, that may you know, and, and like you said before, that might be a, a really good thing for a discussion forum post or even a, a support case with us here. Uh, we'd be glad to help you further on that if we just need to understand it better. And I think maybe they'd be better served elsewhere, but we'd, we'd, we'd love to help you out with that. So uh, we're in the forums. If you don't happen to have a support account with us, you could put anybody can sign up for a forum account, post in there. We're in there all the time. Uh, other Autodesk folks are in there all the time. So, um, you know, if, if it's something that can be known about the program has been out for a couple of years, the feature, mm -hmm. it's probably already been covered. So chances are, um, and if, you know, start a new thread, lots of new eyes out there on new threads. So don't ever hesitate to post the forums. We're in there as well as many, many, many other uh, people that have been using the software for years and years uh, know it far better than we do as far as a usability standpoint. So. And looks like we got, uh, there's a bunch of thank yous coming in and uh, thank you back in return. But it uh, looks like one last question here we can get to is from Isa. And that is, how do I escape from the hatch hang screen? The hatch hang screen, wow. Um, again, sounds like the beginnings of a good support case. Mm -hmm. So, uh, or, or support forum uh, thread. So either way, we in, in, invite you to to give that to us that way, and we'll be happy to go over that. Uh, maybe something that's more in depth than what we can cover right now, right here today. I just want to return to the VP freeze thing. If you don't have this new VP freeze option selected for a given layer, then when you make new viewports, that layer shouldn't be frozen in the new viewports that you create. But if you're noticing that every new viewport that you create, a particular layer is frozen in, in them, this is probably the culprit right here in the Layer Properties Manager. And uh, so take a look at that, see if that isn't the case. That's probably it. If, uh, if that's not it, uh, or if things don't seem to be working correctly for you, any technical challenges, we always want to invite you to contact us here in support. Uh, send us a file, that's, you know, make us a video. However you can get the information to us to clarify, we'd be more than happy to go over with you and, and check into it further. All right, so I just want to say thank you all again for joining us here. Uh, I have a couple of slides left to show you to close up. And so we're going to go ahead and switch over there and uh, close out. If anyone has uh, any other further questions, um, go ahead and ask them now because uh, we're going to be closing up this webinar here. So we got uh, a couple of other screens here. So thanks again for joining us. I know a lot of you were new and uh, a lot of you, the bulk majority of you came in uh, again and uh, had already attended some of our previous webinar sessions. So again, uh, for future ideas and suggestions, go ahead and visit um, our uh, site here. It's a tiny URL. You can make suggestions there. Uh, link is also available in your emailed uh, let's see, webinar um, reminder here. And again, you can also leave feedback in our uh, forums. Again, that tiny URL site or email us directly at audest.help.webinars uh, at audest.com and subject line build your AutoCAD IQ. And that covers uh, Q&A and the webinar for today. And again, yes, you can view it after broadcast. You'll need to give us a couple minutes here. We're going to upload the video and then it should be made available uh, publicly for review. So thanks again for, um, for attending. And uh, Zach and I will check in with you all next month. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, end the session. Thanks again. Take care, everyone.